practices that um, can help to to strengthen teams in a kind of remote first context that we find ourselves in now. Um, and once I've got my slides working, then it'll be even better. Um, bear with me. So when we think about remote work, it's just Zoom and Slack, isn't it? Isn't that right? That's, that's really simple, right? End of presentation. So obviously, it's a little bit more involved than that. Um, we do need some new tools, and the tools are improving very quickly, as we know. Um, but it's in incredibly important that we also have some ground rules and some practices to go along with these tools. It's not simply about having some tools in place. We need to have ways of working as well to make this stuff effective. And particularly when we're remote, uh, when we're physically separated from other people, if we've not understood how to interact with other people, particularly other teams, then there's a danger that we're going to reinforce a negative us and them separation. Um, it's going to, uh, collaboration is going to slow down. People are going to lose trust. And effectively, it's going to kill, you know, the latest digital transformation, DevOps transformation, agile transformation, whatever the latest flavor of transformation is this, uh, this year, it's going to kill that because people are not going to understand the intent and ways of working that they need to have in order to uh, pull together as an organization and be effective. So here's the book, Team Topologies, that Barry mentioned. It was published in 2019, September 2019 by IT Revolution Press. That's the home of DevOps Handbook, Phoenix Project, the latest Unicorn Project, Project to Product, Accelerate, all these books here. It's a great family of books, as in fact, there's a brand new book published yesterday called Agile Conversations, which uh, fits very, very well with uh, a lot of the um, material that we're talking about today. So if you've not heard of it yet, go and check out Agile Conversations on um, uh, from IT Revolution. Um, so in this session today, we're sharing some one or two specific ideas from the book and look at how they apply in a remote, uh, remote kind of remote team, remote first context. And the session today will look like this. We've got four um, sections. The first one on team dependencies and what we mean. Then we'll look at some ways to set team boundaries. The third section is on what we call purposeful interactions. And finally, a little bit on how we can help to grow feedback between different groups in the organization. So first of all, a <coughs> little bit on, on, um, on team dependencies. It's worthwhile saying first that there are always dependencies uh, when we're doing software delivery. Um, even if you have a fully cross-functional autonomous team, that team is still depending on some infrastructure or some kind of platform or some data services or something that is actually exists somewhere else. Um, many times those dependencies are effectively hidden or we don't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt if you like, because, because of the way, th because those dependencies don't block our flow of change. Um, but there are always dependencies there, and it's important for us to actually be realistic about the presence of these of these dependencies. When we're remote first, it's absolutely vital to understand who is working on what inside the organization, um, to understand which teams uh, have a particular purpose around certain kind of um, services or software or whatever. Um, it's often to easy if we're working in the same physical building we kind of remember oh yeah it's jim who works on that service and it's sarah who works on that thing so i can just go and speak to them when we're not in the same building we actually have to define this stuff much more carefully and in the team topologies book we um, explain a, a concept 
called the Team API. And this is effectively the, the definition of the way in which other teams in the organization can and should interact with a, a team. So in this case, with our team. Um, so API comes is a technical term from, from programming, meaning application programming interface. It's the, it's the kind of the definition of how to interact with that blob of software, if you like, whether it's a component or a service. And what we're doing is we're taking that technical term and applying it to a kind of social group, which is a team. Uh, and there's, there's lots of reasons for doing that. Um, we won't go into them particularly in this session today, but it, it relates strongly to Conway's law because there's a kind of mirroring between the communication paths in an organization and the software architecture that is likely to result. And in the software architecture, we have APIs for the technical parts. So the mirroring suggests a kind of team API. And we're, we describe it like this. Um, for effective team first ownership of software, teams need to continuously define, advertise, test, and evolve their team API. If you want to check that one out, it's actually on page 48 um, of the book. So let's have a look at what, what we mean by a team API. We need to define the artifacts owned by the team. That, the artifacts might be the things that we, we produce typically. So that, that may be the services that we run or the, the, the libraries that we build. We need to define our versioning and testing approach. We need to uh, be able to point people to our wiki and documentation. We need to bring to the surface our practices and principles, the roadmap for the stuff that we're working on, um, and so on. And crucially, particularly for a remote first uh, context, it's this roadmap and priorities um, that are, are, are incredibly important for people to see, to understand what to expect from us as a team. Um, and we can also uh, define uh, our preferences for how communication happens with us. So um, we like to hang out in this Slack channel or these three Slack channels, or we, we like to use these few channels in Microsoft Teams, um, or we prefer to be on a permanent video call. Whatever it is, here's the way in which we prefer to communicate. That's effectively the, the kind of part of the API into the team. So um, here's an example from uh, a GitHub repository, which I'll just show you. So we've got a set of GitHub repositories um, with a bunch of templates. Um, so these are all kind of open source, if you like. So it's technically it's Creative Commons, share alike. So you can go there, you can send a pull request, you can use it, you can, uh, as long as you attribute, um, uh, you can use it as you like. And this is a kind of template as an example for how to um, define this team API. So we've got things like this, team name and focus. Um, what kind, what type of team are we? Um, in the book, we talk about four different kinds of teams, a stream aligned team, an enabling team, a complicated subsystem team, and a platform team. And so if we, we can define, well, what kind of team are we? That indicates to other people the kind of ways uh, in which they're gonna expect us to behave. Are we part of a platform? It might, uh, might be important, it might not be, and so on. So listing out all kind of aspects of how this team kind of works and the properties of it um, so that other people understand how to interact with others as a team. So this, this complements very well some work done over the last kind of 15, 20 years by people like Diana Larson and Jutta Eckstein, who have done a lot of work uh, inside the team for things like Team Charter and things like this, which uh, where the team, it's inside that team grouping, the individuals uh, agree on how to work together. This is something that's much more kind of externally facing, facing outwards from the team, which helps other groups in the organization interact with the, the team as a single unit. Um, and there's various other things in this template as well, kind of what we're working on, um, what we're, what we're working, uh, how we're improving our, our, our practices, 
we can also list kind of teams that we currently interact with or we expect to interact with in the future and so on to help kind of have the right kind of conversations. So that's on GitHub. Um, I think we can probably, maybe Manuel, if you drop the, um, drop that GitHub link, I'll put it in the chat actually. Yeah, I've done it. You've done it, great, that's in the chat. Um, and it's also really important to be aware of the dependencies that our team has on other teams. Um, again, bringing, bringing this kind of information to the surface rather than just relying on being in the same physical space, let's bring this information to the service and make it uh, very, um, very declarative, if you like. And uh, what we have here is another GitHub repository. Um, there's actually based, there's a spreadsheet in here that's actually based originally on, um, on something from Spotify, I think, um, and a couple of other sources. Um, that gets us to think about the other teams on which we depend. And we can, we can identify that uh, some of these dependencies, are, we're waiting on them, we can't make progress. Some of these dependencies, well, we can still make some progress, but it's, it's gonna slow us down. And other dependencies where it doesn't affect us at all in terms of our flow of delivery. So the GitHub repository is here. Same story, it's a Creative Commons license. Um, and um, you can see the original kind of Spotify dependency tracker here, but here's, it, there's, there's, a, there's an example here. Um, so the, the, the important thing here is with this, with this kind of spreadsheet format is, it's not the kind of static spreadsheet that's important, it's, the, it's to inform our awareness of the kind of relationships yes. that we have with other groups. And we're making this accessible to multiple people in the organization. There is a great book also published by IT Revolution Press called Making Work Visible. Well, the, the, the reason why they probably got added, and, and again, I, you can take them out. I'm okay with that and everything. Sorry about that. I think that person was on the wrong call. So there's a great book called Making Work Visible by Domenica de Grandis. That's also published by IT Revolution Press. Uh, if you've not got a copy of this book, go ahead and get it or persuade your manager or someone to buy it for you. Um, it's really, really awesome. Um, and it has some great kind of practical um, sort of exercises and techniques for, uh, as you'd expect, making lots of different kinds of work visible, but crucially in, in tracking dependencies between teams. Some of the techniques might, to be, might need to be slightly modified to make it work in a remote context. So instead of using you know, sticky notes and putting them on a, on a physical board, you might need to use something like you know, a mirror board or a, a mural board or something else. But the, the principle is the same. We're, we're, we're surfacing the information. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is remove, so eliminate blocking dependencies. We need to mitigate dependencies that are slow to find ways to speed up those dependencies or move around them. And then dependencies that work, let's say kind of like a platform or a, a library package or some sort of service, if they work for us, then we keep them because they're helping us to deliver a smooth, um, smoothly and, and, and effectively. <clears throat> Another um, thing that's kind of important to do in this remote first context is to make sure that we take the time to build um, networks of human beings, social networks, but I, I don't mean social networks online, I mean e the equivalent of in-person social networks. So when we're in the office, we might stop by the kitchen or the coffee machine to grab ourselves a coffee or a tea or whatever, and then we'll meet someone there and have a chat. And often that kind of informal ad hoc meeting can be very, very beneficial because we get, to, we, we get to build a relationship with those people. And then maybe in three weeks time, we're in a meeting where something's a bit difficult, we have to discuss that, but we've had a coffee with them and we've already kind of built up a relationship. But, we, but in a remote context, we have to make 
explicit time for that kind of interaction to happen. Um, so it could be a scheduled time. It could just be um, you know, 15 minutes a day. It could be combined with some kind of social Slack channel or something else. The key thing here is we have to explicitly bake in, make time for that kind of more random, more ad hoc uh, conversation to happen. <clears throat> um, the, if, if we've already been, um, so many organizations run things like lunchtime tech talks. Some people call them brown bag sessions. We might even have uh, internal conferences. Obviously, in the past, these typically would have been in person. Now they're going to be online if they're happening. But we need to make sure that we continue to, to uh, sustain and nurture these kind of um, communities. It could, be a, it could be a guild, community of practice, um, yeah, a, a lunchtime talk group, whatever it might be. Continue to sustain these things, but make sure that they still work in a remote context. So have the discipline on, on a Zoom call like we are now. People get used to muting and, 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 um, and get used to the kind of tools and so on. Um, but we need to keep these kind of social um, engagement, social uh, uh, opportunities. We need to nurture them and keep them going. Manuel, I think this is your section now, isn't it? Yep. So let me just share my screen. Here we go. So hopefully you can see my screen now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about team boundaries. Um, essentially what I mean by this is, you know, for teams to understand um, what they should and shouldn't expect from other teams. Um, and like Matthew was mentioning, in a physical office, it, this is easier by because you can just go and talk to the person um, at their desk or we meet them at the, in the kitchen or the, by the water cooler. And in the remote world or remote first world, this, this is not as easy to, to happen, right? And the fact is there are different kind of group sizes that um, lead to different types of interactions between uh, people and different levels of trust. So uh, I would, I guess some of you will be familiar with um, Dunbar's number. So Robin Dunbar is an anthropologist and he did a lot of research around how, you know, going from um, across different civilizations and different settings, how, how groups of people form and what that means in terms of the, the trust and interactions between them. And kind of one of the key ideas, which is often called Dunbar's number, is that um, an individual social network, the number of meaningful relationships they can keep, is typically in the order of 100 to 200 individuals. So often this is, you know, people take the average of 150, but obviously it's, it's kind of a range. Um, so that means th that's the number... And, and the research is related to actually kind of the, our physical characteristics as humans, kind of our brain size. Um, the, we have this limitation on how many people we can actually know well enough that we, you know, in an office setting or work setting, we know who they are. We know which team they're working for. We know how the work of that team relates to our work um, and so on. So this is interesting. And in fact, what he... He, he did the research more recently where he was trying to validate if this number applies also in actual social media networks and, and that turned out to be true. So that's quite interesting as well. Um, and this means that there are actually different trust levels and group sizes that promote different uh, behaviors from people. Um, there's a very interesting article from Ben Ford who has a uh, uh, background in military and and then and now he's in, in software delivery and so there's an interesting article he wrote about social inflection points and he's like saying there's the same kind of groupings um, in the military as the ones that um, Robin Dunbar found uh, where you have you know up to eight people compose a section which would be a team typically in, in software development um, and then in the study by Robin Dunbar was a for example, a hunting party and so on. 30 to 50 would be a, a troop or a tribe. 
um, and 100, 250, that kind of Dunbar number that I mentioned is would be um, a village that the maximum, typically the maximum of number that would be uh, living in the same village. So what does this mean in kind of our software delivery context? Um, it means we should be paying attention at these different, different levels. Um, so we can have teams, we know are typically seven plus minus two people because we found that's also kind of um, often the, the ideal number in terms of reducing communication overhead, and making sure the team is uh, gelled and people know each other well enough to, to be um, more efficient working together. But that can go up to about 15. Um, and then you have that, that 150 number which perhaps is a good number to think about in terms of how many uh, people work in the same business area, for example, or business domain. Um, so that's perhaps around um, seven, eight teams um, and so on. So think about these different groupings as kind of leverage or, or indicators of how we should organize the, um, our companies as well. So the key factor is that trust dynamics will change when crossing these different boundaries. So we shouldn't expect that people will behave the same way, whether they're uh, working inside their own team or working in, in a group of um, 50 people or 150 people. Michael. So let, to make it perhaps a bit more uh, clear with an example, so this, there's actually a case study from AutoTrader um, in the book. Um, so for people in the UK, I'm, gu I'm guessing AutoTrader is, is very familiar to you. So they, they had, they used to run these um, magazines for, you know, uh, people interested in automobiles and, you know, prices and use and, and so on. And so they had to move everything to the digital world some years ago. And one interesting thing they did was in their office space, so you see their building here, they decided that each floor would have all the teams related to one business domain or one business area. Um, so this is not perhaps literally how those teams were, <laughs> were placed in those floors, but just to give you an example, um, since they have these three different clear value streams around private car sales, commercial car sales, and car leasing, um, all the teams working in car leasing, for example, would be on the same floor. And what this would promote is that the interactions between those teams would be easier, more fluid. Um, and so it was not just technical teams, but any team working that uh, business area, marketing, sales, etc. cetera. Um, so what they're trying to do that is promote the right kind of interactions, make it easier for the teams that are, whose work is, is more closely related to be able to, to talk and um, interact uh, easily. So kind of the question in the remote world is how do we, uh, how does this, you know, make sense in the remote world? And um, perhaps in many situations, what we're seeing is having, you know, Slack obviously is a useful tool, but how do we set it up in a way that it promotes good interactions? If we just have one giant Slack for the whole organization, where perhaps you have 300 people in the same Slack or 500 or more, uh, that's probably not a good way to address uh, this kind of this different trust boundaries and also individuals feeling that, you know, I'm in this huge slack with all these people and perhaps they don't feel um, safe to express some opinions because they don't know who is um, going to read it or perhaps they don't feel like it's easy to understand where they should uh, post some questions or where, which channels should they be listening to. Uh, so there's too much noise and there's kind of lack of direction for people if you have this kind of virtual setup. So thinking back to the auto trader example, you know, this could make sense also in a virtual world where we say, well, actually, each of these clearly different business domains should have their own Slack. And we, sh we try to limit that to the Dunbar's number around 100, 150 or 200 maximum. So that we have a space that is more uh, correlates to this trust boundary uh, where teams that are more closely related have a uh, common space, but they, but not every single person in the organization uh, is there. And so, you know, this is the example from AutoTrader might look like this where each of those business areas have their own Slack. 
Um, so we're organizing the communication and the tools according to the business value streams. Um, that can be quite useful. And then obviously inside each Slack, we, will, uh, we should be thinking about how do we set up the actual um, channels or, or spaces of communication uh, in an effective way that promote the, the good types of interactions. So in this slide, it's just an example, obviously, um, you have here, you know, obviously if each team should have their own channel so they can, you know, that's where most of communication on a daily basis will happen inside the team. Um, and, you know, that those might be private channels or, or public if the team decides to, to do that. Um, but then you see, uh, if you look at the bottom left, you see a couple of channels where you might have, for example, stream team one and the platform team working together on some monitoring service. Let's imagine, you know, we are developing a new monitoring service in the platform for the stream teams or the product teams to use. And so it makes sense that during a period of time, there will be this channel that is specific for that kind of interaction to happen. Um, obviously, if, if that's the choice of the two teams, if they prefer to be on a video call uh, all the time and you know the timing of when that's happening is clear, that's, that's fine as well. Um, but assuming they, they want to have kind of a synchronous communication channel, then this would be a good idea. And if you look, for example, at the top right, you see there are a couple of channels for support. You know, imagine we have a team, perhaps a platform team is giving support to some logging service. It would probably make sense to have a channel for that um, to support you know, any kind of issues around the, the logging service. Um, so having you know, clearly um, named and dedicated spaces in the virtual uh, tools for teams to clearly and easily identify where should they go to ask certain questions or ask for support um, besides their own internal team channel, which is kind of uh, common and, and normal to find, uh, these other channels and this way of setting it up uh, can be quite helpful. Obviously at the individual level, you see on the bottom right, um, Mary, for example, you know, you should have in the description your, your team and your kind of um, overall role as well, so that makes it easy to identify different people in the Slack. In this example of these channels, we are using the terminology in the book. Um, so we're talking about this, this specific topologies and types of teams, but it can be anything, whatever makes sense in your organization. If you talk about application teams and support teams and so on, you, you know, you can use that. Um, the key is really to facilitate the discovery of where the communication spaces and, and where should I um, go to ask a question or and so on. Um, so having some conventions, and again, these are just ideas. It doesn't mean that you have to follow this or that this is the, the right way, but having some conventions that help us understand, you know, where is team X, you know, responding to, to questions? Where should I go to, you know, if I need to um, interact or, or discuss some, some around some problem or some some solution and so on. Essentially having some conventions that make sense for your organization um, in order to increase the discoverability, um, to make it easier for people to navigate the virtual space. And that in fact relates to this idea of reducing cognitive loads on, on teams and people because you're making it easier to understand how communication should happen, how interactions are expected and reducing the kind of the burden on people to actually go through that and sort that out by themselves. The, the easier we make it and having conventions helps um, increase the discoverability than the less, the, the lower the cognitive load. And so with that I'll go back to Matthew. Just stop my... So Let's have a look at some um, other ideas to to make interaction a bit have a bit more purpose, a bit bit more declarative, if you like. And the first thing to do is to we need to do a bit of myth busting. We need to there is a bit of a myth inside many organisations that in order to be more effective, all we need to do is talk to each other, talk to everyone, co collaborate with 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 everyone in the organisation. And 
aside from being completely impractical, because as soon as you start to um, talk to more than you know a handful of people, the number of different kind of permutations is uh, explodes. So it's just simply not possible. It, it's also actually um, there's been some recent uh, scientific research on this inside organisations, inside organisations with people doing. And knowledge work and doing kind of discovery type work, which is very much what we're doing when we're building software systems. And they, they ran some interesting experiments um, that actually showed that continuous collaboration produced less good results than um, occasional collaboration. And I mean, it, the, the details kind of matter and, and you know, it's, it's debatable how, how much this applies, but there's some, some very interesting research in this space kind of over the last couple of years. And um, ultimately we, we, we cannot and should not expect to talk to everyone else. Um, we need to, if you think about, think about this from a kind of the position of a software system, if you had every single class or module communicating with every single other module, it would be kind of like a cacophony, it would be a complete mess. It, it probably wouldn't achieve the right kind of outcome. And that's the sort of, you know, with Conway's law in mind, that's the sort of similar thing that we'd expect within an organization. We'd expect to have much more clearly defined kind of interrelationships between different teams that are working on different things. We should not expect everyone to have to talk to, to everyone else. So really kind of defining these, the, the types of interactions that we want and expect is, a really key to, uh, is, is really key to having effective teams. And in the book, in, in the Teams Apologies book, we've defined uh, three different team interaction modes. Uh, and we think these are the only three ways in which teams really need to interact. We're still looking for a, 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 an interaction mode that we've missed that we've missed out somehow, but so far we think that these are the only three that are really needed. And uh, these are the, the three different interaction modes of these. We've got collaboration, but for us, collaboration is a very specific thing. It's two teams working together for a defined period of time to achieve a specific outcome. So they've got that they've defined something, they've defined what they're trying to get out of that collaboration, and they've also defined a period of time over which that collaboration will happen. Because too often, so what we've seen, and maybe this is familiar to you, too often in organizations, you, you end up with a couple or three, four teams sort of working together, sort of not, not really understanding why they're having to spend so much time. You know, they feel like they're stepping on each other's toes or they feel like uh, the other team doesn't really understand them and so on. So in this case, collaboration is a very specific thing. We're saying, here's the purpose of this working together and we're going to do it for a specific period of time. And if we haven't achieved our purpose in that period of time, that tells us something. It tells us that we didn't understand the problem or we don't have the right capabilities or the problem is bigger or something else or the, the, the world around us has changed, something. The key thing we're being very specific is saying, we're expecting our daily work to be very different compared to when we, before we were working together. We're expecting our daily work to, uh, to be maybe more challenging because we have to understand the perspective of a team with very different uh, skills or, or background or something. So it will feel more challenging than when we're just working as a single team. The second team interaction mode uh, we've called X as a service. This is where one team is providing something and another team is consuming that thing. That can be a service, it can be a library, a component, whatever. Um, and so that you can see there, the interaction would feel very different from collaboration. If we expect just to consume something, then there should be very little communication that we need to consume that thing. We might need to know where it lives, but pretty much after that, we, can, we should expect to be able to consume it. Now, if it, if it turns out that it's very difficult for us to consume that thing and we have to spend lots of time talking to the team that's providing that thing that again that tells us something it tells us the developer experience is not there the usability is not there the documentation is missing uh, maybe the, the the boundary of that component or service is in the wrong place because it's too hard to consume or something else the key thing there is we're being very conscious we're saying this is the, the interaction that i expect 
is it the interaction I'm getting? Um, and the final team interaction mode that we talk about in the book is called facilitating. And this is where one team is sort of helping, uh, helping another team to increase their capability or their awareness, um, and also to uh, get an, an external perspective on, on, on that team's uh, situation, if you like. Um, possibly to be able to say, well, actually, uh, something in the organization is missing, which is preventing this team from, from being as effective as it can be. And that also feels very different. The team that's doing the facilitating typically is a team of experts. Um, but those experts actually have to work in a way which, where they do not jump in and do all the work. They have to support and mentor the, the team that they're helping. So that interaction can feel very different. Um, again, the key thing here is being explicit about the kind of interaction that we're expecting and that, that we're currently engaged in with other teams and bring that to the surface, make it much more explicit. So, because we, we can't just rely on walking across the office to, to speak to someone to sort something out. In a, in a very small part of an organization, we might represent these different interactions and team types like this. So we've got a platform in blue at the bottom, providing some services to a streamlined team in the middle in yellow. Um, and that kind of black, two black lines represent um, X as a service. So they're providing something as a service and the streamlined team in yellow is just consuming that thing from the platform. The streamlined team in the middle is also consuming something from the complicated subsystem team shown in orange. Um, so the streamlined team in the middle should should expect itself to be quite independent. It's, it's, it's consuming a couple of different services from two different teams, but generally speaking, because it's consuming them as a service, it should expect its, its, its delivery, if you like, to be, to be very smooth. Contrast that with the team at the top, the streamlined team at the top in yellow. That team is uh, collaborating with the complicated subsystem team. It's working on an improved interface, or it's working on improved... Uh, usability or some new data, something, something anyway, they're working very closely together. They know that because it's collaboration, it's going to be more, it's not going to feel as smooth as normal, but that's deliberate because we want to work together with them to get the best kind of interface for that component. The same streamlined team is also having some kind of uh, facilitating interaction with the enabling team in purple, shown in, the, in vertical on the right hand side. Perhaps that streamlined team is also uh, migrating its database from one, one database system to another and needs some help from some database specialists inside the enabling team to do that. Um, we're setting expectations about the kind of interactions that we, ex that we expect to have and we're, we're setting expectations about the length of time that those, that, that those kind of interactions should take place for. We expect it to take us three weeks to migrate from Oracle to Postgres, for example. If it's taking a lot longer, that's a signal for us to stop, think, raise some questions, um, and, uh, and so on. And the same with the, with the collaboration interaction. If it's taking us too long to discover the boundary, is something else missing? Are we doing the right thing? Do we need more help in, inside the team? Do we need more skills? Are we trying to do this in, in the wrong way at the wrong kind of interface level? So again, just to reiterate the point, we're trying to make all of our interactions and ways of working around the team as explicit as possible. Don't forget, this is, this is just a snapshot of a moment in time or this week, next week or in three weeks time, the interactions will probably be different and that's a good thing. So just back to this team API template again, you can see how this then starts to help us to explain to other teams what their expectations should be of what we're doing. So here's an example that we filled in. Um, if we're a streamlined team built with an end-to-end -end responsibility for one particular service, we might say, well, at the moment we are interacting with a test automation team in a kind of facilitating way. That means the test automation team is 
facilitating us to understand test automation better in this case. So the purpose there is understand test automation and data management examples for, for IOS. And we expect that to take three weeks. Being very, very, very explicit about that kind of relationship with other teams. Contrast that with um, this second interaction we've got here. We're collaborating with a face recognition team who are building a complicated subsystem. Um, we're looking there to define the errors and workflow and so on. We actually expect that to take two months. So we've got different expectations, different kind of relationships that will have a different feel in terms of how you work with that other team. So, we're, so we're, we now know what to expect. And if that's working fine, that's great. If, it's, if, the, if that kind of feeling of working with the other team is very different, we can raise it as a problem and then do something about it nice and quickly. Effectively, we're using awkwardness in team interactions as a sensing mechanism for evolution of our teams and organization. Just a very quick bit here, another myth that we need to bust, which is uh, the organizational chart or org chart. Um, Top-down org charts can be very useful when there's a crisis or where there's, there's uh, rapid decisions that need to be made or in um, a kind of regulatory environment, something like that. It can be very useful, but in practice for, for most situations, um, the org chart doesn't represent how communication happens. And communication really happens, as shown with the black lines in here, uh, in, in ways which cut right across the different organizational, uh, organizational charts. Um, and there may be even some people who are kind of isolated. There's a really good book called Team of Teams by General Stanley McChrystal. If you've not read it, go and get a copy or steal or, or borrow a copy. Um, he is a former uh, army general in the US Army and talks about when they went into uh, Iraq uh, fighting Al Qaeda. Um, and at the time, the US Army was very hierarchical, had been designed like on the left. And the enemy that, were, that they were facing, the challenge, the problem they were facing was organized much more like on the right-hand side. So completely unhierarchical. And they realized that they had to radically change how the, um, how the US Army was, was arranged in terms of its communication in order to meet the, um, the goal, which was to, to, to fight al Qaeda. And so they actually had to ch radically change the internal communication structure and decision structure of the organization in order to uh, achieve goals that they set out to achieve. So we really need to let real needs drive the interactions between teams, not kind of an organizational chart. So thinking much more consciously, you know, in software context, we're thinking about uh, the kind of software architecture that we need to build to meet user needs and business needs. And therefore we're thinking much more consciously about the kind of communication between different teams and groups in the organization, because that communication is going to be driving the likely software architecture that's going to be uh, produced. What we don't want to do is fall into the trap that uh, this person, Justin Garrison, fell into, uh, who, and he, he reports it like this. Uh, I had a manager tell me I couldn't have lunch with my friends anymore because they were on the dev team and I was ops. And he didn't want communication to happen between teams that didn't go through him. Let's not get ourselves into that situation. Let's try and avoid that, is what we're saying. So being much more explicit about the, the, the ways in which teams need to communicate to be able to build uh, the systems that we're that we're here to build. Um, it's worth being much more explicit about um, what's provided when, particularly if we're part of a platform, let's say, or we're running something or providing a service to other teams. Um, so we've got another template here on GitHub that we call thin platform template. Um, for various reasons, but it's just a set of suggestions for communicating uh, things about the service that we're providing. For example, where's the live status page? Where are the hours of operation? Where's the onboarding documentation? Um, uh, what's the kind of expected response time? This kind of thing. We're being very explicit on a per service level or per kind of technology level 
about um, the uh, kind of experience that other teams will have when they're interacting with us. <clears throat> so over to Manuel for the final short section before we've got some questions. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, a uh, quick last section on uh, feedback. Um, so in this remote first kind of world, then um, feedback becomes even more important, right? Because between different teams, especially. Um, and it's actually a skill that we need to grow in the teams and we need to allow people to get better at giving constructive feedback. And um, even though, you know, Team Topologies doesn't just relate directly to that and there are many resources you can find on how to give positive action or feedback. But just to reinforce the need to, to think about that as um, something we need to promote uh, within the teams. And to give you a very quick example, um, so Twilio, this company is a company in the US and their platform team, what they do to actually promote other teams who are their internal customers, if you like, um, to give feedback is they send out this survey, I think every quarter or perhaps it's more frequent even, where they're asking, so they're developing this platform with self-service capabilities and they're asking the teams that consume the platform, you know, how well does the platform help you run and build and deploy your services and you know is it compelling do you feel like we're listening to your feedback that we are um, fixing the problems that you find and that you get the best tools for the work you need to do and so this is a very simple um, way of asking feedback from other teams to to make sure we're you know going in the right track um, especially for a platform team that as matthew mentioned mostly uh, will be either collaborating on a new service with other teams or will be providing um, X as a service um, capabilities to other teams. So it's very important to get this feedback on a regu regular basis because it, it can be easy to fall into the trap of, well, we have these services for whatever, monitoring, logging, et cetera, that everyone's using and they're fine and everything's okay. If we don't actively ask for feedback, there might be a lot of teams that are actually finding it difficult, but they're not saying anything, or um, you know, they actually have to do kind of some workaround to actually use the platform service, or even they decided not to use it because it doesn't fit their needs. Um, and so this is just an example, obviously, but whatever you find that can help kind of promote feedback between teams um, and build this kind of constructive feedback approach uh, I, I would say this is the right time to invest in that as well. And as in this example, it can be quite simple. This is nothing um, complicated to, to put in place. Um, and overall, you know, in this kind of uncertain times, uh, you're going to have to try out some things to promote, you know, better team interactions. Uh, you can try some of the techniques we, we talked about today. And but at the end of the day, you have to, to try and see what works and what doesn't. And really the point that we're trying to get across is to promote good behaviors, interactions between teams, which are not as easy to um, happen in the, in the virtual space if we don't pay enough attention to that. If we just let it kind of run its own course, then probably you're gonna uh, fall into problems sooner or later. Um, and so besides the book that Matthew already mentioned, we're working, uh, we just had a, a meeting earlier today to um, sort out kind of some of the, the outline and, and some details of this new workbook, uh, specifically around uh, team topologies for remote teams. And that's going to be a free digital workbook, uh, which we want to make available um, sometime in June, hopefully uh, earlier June than, than late June. And so that's, by the way, it's gonna be on IT Revolution Press again. So, you know, either if you follow us or I follow IT Revolution, you'll, you'll hear about it when it comes out. Uh, we also have moved all our training to be uh, more remote friendly or, or remote first, if you like. 
Um, so there are a number of different half-day courses that we, we make available. Uh, as well as the assessments now will be uh, remote first or remote friendly. For the people who are, if you're in kind of team lead or project management uh, kind of position, it could be interesting to have a look at this course, which we um, develop in partnership with the, with the Project Management Institute and it's actually applying the ideas of team topologies um, for project managers and a little bit how some roles might change in terms of being more focused on inter-team, cross-team uh, interactions and facilitating that and enabling that rather than more inside the teams um, as in the past. So that might be interesting. Uh, we put together the resources we have available. So um, videos and, and slides and other links uh, in this page, uh, teamtopology.com slash remote first. And that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. And we're happy to, to answer any questions from the chat or otherwise. Thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks a lot, Manuel. That was really, really interesting, really good. Um, I've got um, I, I've got a few, loads of questions, but I'm going to try and limit it to a, a, a couple and then open it up to everyone else because I know they've got quite a lot of questions as well. So first of all, um, first question really for me is, um, um, you, you talked about like the chaos of, of everyone like collaborating uh, uh, you know, and being able to communicate with each other, which I, I totally agree with. But within the API, is there any, you know, and, and your templates, is, is there anything that, you know, we could do to maybe like, you know, uh, make that a bit more obvious to, to people? Like, for example, could we have an attribute in, in the API, like, talk to us if, you know, uh, you know we want to hear from you, you know, when, you know, type of thing. You know, is that any, is that been a consideration? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so it could work effectively. Your for the for the for the technical folks on the call, you're sort of setting up um, an event listener or uh, asking people to kind of set up an event listener. You say, look, the, the, these are the events that we'll will be interested in. So yeah. please contact us if you see an event. So that pattern, something like that, could work well. Yeah. You, you're making it clear under which circumstances uh, teams should be expecting to communicate into into our team. So it's, it's a good, yeah. Good yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. If, I don't know if, you, if you're still seeing my slides. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So in, in this slide, you can see this is from that platform template um, example. Um, you could especially for teams that have to interact with many other teams, kind of categorize, if you like, or provide more um, specifics on, you know, for a platform team, if you want to report an incident and use this Slack channel, for example, that's dedicated to, you know, to incidents. And if you want to ask for support or general help, uh, then ask via this other channel or via, via email or whatever it might be. So we're, clarifying you know different for different types of uh requests and interactions what kind of channels are preferred so that can be um helpful as well 